Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a show that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios, featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region, because business matters. I'm Gene Morano, a radio and print journalist and the editor of Valley Business Front magazine. Small businesses that have had to adapt and pivot over the past year are the focus. Today, my guests are Beth Bell, Executive Director of the Salem Roanoke County Chamber of Commerce, Jamie Clark, Marketing and Communications Manager for Downtown Roanoke Inc., or DRI, and Pat Pascal, co-owner of the Farm Bergesa Restaurants in Roanoke's Grandin Village and in Vinton. Ladies, welcome to the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Let's start out with Beth. You've been Executive Director now of the uh, Salem Roanoke County Chamber of Commerce for a little, a little over a year now, Beth, or um, you got started a few months before the pandemic started. Good timing. Yeah. Um, what do you remember from those initial days, Beth, when you got started about how uh, how the pandemic just, you know, kind of uh, turned things upside down? What do you remember from that, those initial days and your I members? Think, um, I think just a lot of overwhelm, like, you know, how it just seemed like a huge challenge, you know, to tackle and and how in the world are we going to do this? And then how long is this going to last? Which we, I think we asked ourselves, we're still asking ourselves that, right? But just um, really, I, it was definitely an overwhelming feeling, but right. then we got to work and it was okay. <laughs> uh, who are the, talk about real briefly, who are the members of the Salem Rona County Chamber of Commerce, Beth? Um, how many members are there? And what types of business sectors do they represent? We have about 400 members. Um, it's a variety of Main Street businesses and uh, you know Main Street type of businesses, especially here in Salem, but also manufacturers, banks, you know, hospitals, you know, a big variety of businesses. Uh, Jamie Clark with DRI. Uh, you know, if you had to describe uh, how downtown Roanoke shops and businesses, Jamie, you know, responded to the pandemic. Um, you know, what's the word or words you would use? And has that been evolving over the year? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think all of us at first were kind of uh, in a state of disbelief, which I, I feel like I kind of still am. Um, but I think that really permeated the businesses and, uh, you know, obviously shutdowns and, and all that sort of stuff, trying to figure out how to, um, you know, follow the guidelines that were released at various points. But I, I think the main thing that we saw businesses do is kind of pivot um, pretty quickly. A lot of them, especially for, you know, the, the vast majority of our businesses that are in downtown, I think probably around 99% of our businesses are locally owned. So to see, um, you know, them very quickly change their models um, as much as they were able to, um, you know, I think it was uh, a sign of resiliency and, and just constantly having to, you know, look at what you're allowed to do and find new ways to connect with your customers. Um, so I think um, it, it was um, challenging. It still is challenging, but I think it was also really encouraging to see um, so many of them embrace new ways of doing business. And there have been some casualties, Jamie. There have been some businesses that have just packed it in or uh, gone on long-term suspensions. Uh, but for the most part, does it seem like the overwhelming majority of the businesses have found some way to hang on? Yeah, um, you know, in a, in a typical year, we, we see a, a little bit of business turnover, you know, small businesses historically, um, you know, there's there's a certain amount of turnover in that anyways. Um, and some of them that have closed in the past year have definitely been related directly to the pandemic, maybe wouldn't have closed otherwise. Um, but I don't know that we've seen um, yet, and hopefully this continues to hold true, a, a large number um, that have closed at this point. Um, so much more so than we would have. And I, I hope that that continues to be the case. I think, um, you know, the community has done a really good job of rallying around a lot of these businesses and doing what they can. Many of them are still very far off of where they would normally be. But I think, you know, with, with programs from the government and the state um, and the city, I think that's helped a lot of them hold on um, longer. So, you know, I think it's, yeah. I think that's encouraging. Let me ask you uh, uh, maybe Beth and, um, and, and Jamie about, you know, the CARES Act. Uh, where money was filtered through local governments and the personal protection, uh, personal paycheck protection program with forgivable loans, uh, how much of a factor that's been in, in keeping some of these businesses at least alive, alive through the past year? I'm sure for, go there first. <laughs> yeah, I think for most of them, it's everything, you know, I, for a lot of the businesses, um, you know, I've seen the same thing Jamie said. We really haven't seen a huge number close, but I know there's a lot that are barely hanging on. And so we're just hoping that we get through the next, you know, three to six months and it stays that way. But I do think that 
we would have a worse situation without that funding being available. Yeah, and you I, that now, Jamie, right? What business is taking PPP loans or CARES Act money? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we over the course, you know, and something we do normally, but obviously, especially over the course of these past 10 months, uh, we're in pretty regular contact with our businesses. So, you know, early on, we started sending pretty regular emails um, with information that typically, you know, typically it would be information about what we're doing. Um, but we changed that over to information about, you know, programs available, etc. So, uh, you know, we heard from a large number of people, a uh, large number of businesses that took advantage of those programs um, and have taken advantage or starting to take advantage of the second round. Um, of PPP and absolutely it's been the difference between many more of these businesses closing um, if that hadn't been available. Kat Pascal with uh, Farm Brigade, did you, did you guys have to do the PPP loan or, or were you okay to get through without it? I know you did a lot of pivoting and I want to talk to you about that but did you have to take advantage of the PPP loan? Yes, absolutely. For the first round, um, the very best thing that we could have done is get together and sit down with our bookkeeping and accountant to work out all the details because alone, I don't think we could have gotten through the, the application process really. Um, so yes, it, it, that the funding through the PPP first round was absolutely instrumental to the success of our restaurant and to the survival of our restaurant, I should say. Now, I know a cat at the uh, Farmer Gates in Granite Village you had an issue with seating people inside because you just couldn't get enough tables in there uh, with the, with the guidelines to make it work. Are, are you seating people inside now at this point? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we started seating people in September. Uh, we waited a little bit longer. Our Brandon location is actually bigger, so we can seat people there a little more safely. Our Vinton location is the one that struggled. We only have about 800 square feet over there. So that was really tough to be closed for such a long time. Once we were open for, or allowed to be open for dining, we held out a little bit longer um, than some other restaurants, but we ended up opening our doors in September with the spacing and everything, um, it's, with the guidelines in mind. And so fortunately we've been able to, to stay open since then. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of the pivoting though you did uh, for a while last summer, Kat, you and some other uh, neighbors, local roots restaurant, you, you basically rented out a parking lot behind your buildings and <laughs> built an al fresco outdoor uh, dining area. Talk about that experience and maybe what you learned about pivoting from that experience. Oh, absolutely. So, so many, the word of the year was pivot really. So everything that we did was almost new and rolling out new, new concepts and new ideas. One of those included the village dining. And so I'm on the board for the grand and Village Business Association. And one of the things that we uh, sent out or what, at, what we wanted to do was we wanted to use the parking lot behind um, Taza, behind Grace's Place, the ones that we use for the parking spaces or the diners um, and closed it off and closed it, went to Lowe's, asked them to donate some buckets for us. Um, Grace's Place, husband poured the concrete. We put can of, uh, car tent canopies out there. It was a very makeshift <laughs> outdoor seating and maybe not the most scenic, but it may do and it may do for a safe environment and for people to gather together. It also brought the camaraderie of the Grandin Village restaurants together. So Taza, Local Roots, um, Rockfish, Urban Gypsy, all of the restaurants were on board. We had QR codes on all the tables so that we could then invite people to go shopping in the boutiques or at least online shopping for the boutiques out there. So it was a, a really nice collaborative effort of the Grand and Village Business Association and the businesses there. Kind of a good business lesson too about pivoting and staying light on your feet and adapting. Oh, absolutely. Everything that we did was uh, learning as we went and rolling with the punches really. So the, the, the times that we were told it okay, now you have to space out outside. So we were figuring out how, how to space everything outside and how to make people feel the most comfortable um, during this time of the unknown outside and, and dining and still supporting their local restaurants. I see Beth Bell from the Salem Rono County Chamber of Commerce shaking your head. Beth, you have a lot, a lot of members that you see a lot of these people, a lot of camaraderie and, and, and people pivoting and, and, and coming up with new ideas. I know that uh, curbside delivery curbside pickup, that type of thing became a big thing. Yeah, a huge thing. Um, and, you know, I think Kat and the Grandin area did such a great job setting an example, too, of just how to keep things moving. 
Um, I enjoyed, I, you know, the outdoor dining. I also think it says a lot, Kat, that you guys are expanding in Benton despite all of this. So I think that's amazing. Um, and with our members, we definitely saw, you know, people getting creative, people signing up for things like DoorDash and Uber Eats and things they really haven't always wanted to be a part of. Um, restaurants starting their own delivery, retailers starting delivery and, and changing the way they were doing things with Facebook live shopping. And, you know, we have, we have several retailers in the Salem area that said their year ended up being, you know, just as good as last year, their holiday shopping and things like that. So it's just, you know, I, think, I think in some ways sort of because of quite frankly, big companies like Amazon, they're more used to shopping online. So if they can shop online with a local retailer, I think they're not as hesitant maybe as they were a few years ago. I know Jamie, um, uh, downtown, you saw some of online shopping, also saw a lot of takeout and pickup delivery. I know that uh, recently there, there, were, there were curbside delivery parking spaces downtown. So how much uh, were things like takeout and, and shops going online helpful to keeping businesses downtown going? Yeah, I mean, I think it was really the difference maker um, for quite a number of months um, and still continues to be for people that aren't comfortable going in certain places or, you know, obviously we don't know at, at what point restrictions may need to change. Um, so making it easy for people to come to a pickup order, whether it's, you know, at a restaurant or at a retailer, even, which is not really something we had ever seen before, but a number of our retailers um, were offering curbside pickup, delivery, as Beth mentioned, um, which is really interesting to see some of these smaller businesses do. But um, yeah, the, you know, the, one of the things that we hear obviously frequently about downtown is parking. Um, and I'm of the opinion, um, and in my experience here, is it's really more of a, of a perception issue um, that there's no parking. I think um, if you're comfortable coming down here, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to find parking. So that's something that we work on, but I think the curbside spaces have um, helped to eliminate that barrier for a lot of people. You know, we have 30 spaces, 15 minute parking. It's easy to pull in, grab what you need and go. Um, so I think that added convenience has been um, a big boost for the businesses that are offering takeout um, and curbside pickup. Kat, how much did takeout and, and delivery, if you did delivery, mean to your business in the throes of the pandemic? Yeah, so in March, we had to close down our indoor dining. And fortunately, uh, Jimmy is very, um, very optimistic when it comes to these type of things and, and started creating um, ideas of how to create uh, de in-house delivery. Um, so what we ended up doing is turning our servers into drivers. And so we ended up giving them a percentage of what the deliveries were. Our deliveries we had never done deliveries before, but it was booming at that time. Like it was something that we said, why didn't we think of this before? Why hadn't we done it before? And maybe it wouldn't have worked before, but it really created um, that, that sense of our employees thinking, knowing that we were looking out for them too, because we didn't want them to be out of a job. We didn't want to close our doors. We just opened our doors at the Grand Inn location in January. So to be closed down two months later, it was really tough. So pivoting into the deliveries and the curbside and to to advertise that and to advertise that we were looking out for our staff to continue to be employed really resonated I think with the community um, and talking about you know making all those changes like the downtown rent that Jamie was talking about it was really nice to see other restaurants and other boutiques and other um, brick and mortar places come up with different things that they could do homeburgessa kits were something that we did uh, which was create or make your burger at home. Those ended up selling really well. I know that cocktails were uh, really nice things to go to in the downtown restaurants. Those were some really awesome things to see. And I think that like to go clothing from the boutiques in downtown were really like as a business owner, I'm always looking at other business owners and being admi or admiring them and being inspired by them. So just seeing those things work during the pandemic and continuing to work is just a really nice thing. I, uh, and I wanted to bring up, Beth brought it up, uh, Kat, I wanted to bring up that you are uh, in, the, in the process of expanding in, in, in Vinton. So that's, I guess you're bullish about the next, the next year or so, or bullish about business in the next six months. 
I we're very optimistic about what we what we foresee for Vinton. Um, Vinton is a, a growing community and a growing town. They've got plenty of other businesses coming into Vinton. So I just see Vinton booming uh, during this time and in the next few years. So for us to have been able to purchase the lot next to us with the contingency that we will be um, doing work to it in construction, it, it's it's really it's a great thing for us. Um, because we'll be able to seat more people too. So we'll be able to seat about 40 people at, at that location and also serve beer and wine. So are you gonna be building from the ground up? Yes, uh, well, we'll actually we're we'll expanding and, and our, our plans have changed a little bit just because of the soil and the surveying that's going on right now. So there's a lot of talks with the city or the town the architects and the surveyors. So some things might be changing, but nonetheless, it's gonna be a patio style on the outside, mm -hmm. on the side of the building. I wanted to ask uh, Beth, uh, and we've talked about this before, and Jamie, you can chime in too, but a lot of small businesses, Beth, that really did not have much of an online presence before, you know, a site to sell on, or even a Facebook site or something to sell on, are, are, are did a lot more of them by the end of the year or the middle of last year see the, the need for that? And is there still a lot more training that some of these people need, need to do or, you know, to seek help in getting an online presence, a commerce presence? Yeah, I think so. What, I, what I've seen a lot is, you know, not really having e-commerce sites, but doing more of social selling and, um, you know, they'll do the difference in, you know, Amazon and a small business owner is that that small business owner will walk around the store with you on FaceTime, dressing you, picking out the perfect gift. They'll do whatever it takes to get you what you need. And um, I saw a lot more of that than a real like e-commerce setup. And that was, you know, I think for a lot of people, um, technology is a bar barrier. They don't really want to have to go to a real online selling site, you know, a real e-commerce site. So it's been, it, you know, it, that's something that for me as a chamber, and I know um, the Small Business Development Center also does a lot of classes, but on that type of thing, but it'll be interesting to me to see if they embrace more of a real e-commerce setup um, as we, you know, continue into this pandemic and not being at full capacity. But most of the, most of our members and, and other retailers I know, it seemed like they did a lot more of just personalized shopping and getting on Facebook. I did see a lot of people join Facebook that were not doing much on Facebook before. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a leap, you know, for them <laughs> with technology. So they're, they're not quite there with the e-commerce sites. But we did help a lot of people set up things like at least electronic gift cards so that if, you know, they, you know, people wanted to support that local business, they could at least get online and get that pretty easily. So um, that's what I saw. Uh, Jamie, talk about town. Um, she mentioned gift cards. You've done a couple of gift card things. Uh, uh, when this airs, the, the most recent one will be over. But as far as things like gift cards and two for one uh, gift cards, things like that, uh, have they been successful in, 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 in maybe people stepping up to buy these things to support downtown merchants? Oh, absolutely. We, um, we did one back in the spring, I think it was like April or May, where we bonused $10 on a $25 downtown gift card. Um, and our, our gift cards allow you to, to spend that money at, at any business that accepts, um, that's been signed up and accepts the gift card, which is a pretty, a pretty large list and always growing. Um, so that was huge. We, we've just come off of um, finishing another uh, double bonus, which went extraordinarily well as far as the response. Um, our challenge with that is, you know, the gift cards don't expire. You know, how do we get them to, you know, they, they're very well intentioned. They want to buy these gift cards and spend them downtown, but uh, I don't want them to spend them downtown in July, August, September. I need them to spend them downtown now because this is when the need is for these businesses really. It's, um, so the, the latest round that we did, we, we basically incentivized um, with a gift certificate that has a deadline um, to encourage people to spend, you know, at least a portion of that money within the time frame that we need them to. Um, and I think that's been huge for the businesses. It's just a nice way to um, add an influx of, of funds downtown. It's an easy thing for consumers to go online and purchase them. And then they come down here and use them at um, any number of businesses. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's easy for us to implement as long as we can find the funding for it. Um, and it, it's a boost for the businesses. So I, I think that's been very helpful. Speaking of pivoting, uh, Jamie Clark with DRI, I know you guys had to pivot with Dickens of a Christmas. It wasn't the three Friday nights in December. It normally is. It, it was, and it was 25 days of Dickens. 
yep. a lot of extra lighting downtown, a televised Christmas tree uh, lighting ceremony instead of encouraging people to come out. I, I'm sure it wasn't the same, but the, the, did the merchants downtown appreciate the effort that DRI made uh, to get people downtown to at least see the lights and maybe come in the shops? Absolutely. You know, we heard um, pretty pretty clearly from the businesses once we started um, talking Dickens. You know, typically we're, we're planning Dickens. We start that process in, you know, June. It, it takes a while to pull together. Um, so, you know, when we started talking about it internally, you know, it was what, what can we do? And things are changing constantly. So what can we plan that we feel confident can move forward uh, regardless of what restrictions are changed? Um, so we heard pretty clearly from our businesses when we reached out to them that they really needed us to do something and, to, you know, please don't cancel it. So we were committed to, to finding a way to move forward um, and, and really kind of, you know, spreading it out with the 25 days of Dickens allowed us to um, still drive people downtown, but to let them really kind of choose when they came um, and interacted with downtown and the businesses in whatever way they felt safe. So I think, um, you know, the feedback that we got from the businesses and the, and the public at large too was overwhelmingly positive. You know, we added the Elf on a Shelf adventure, uh, which was incredible. We're definitely going to bring that again. Um, that allowed people to, you know, over the, over the course of um, the 25 days, they could go inside these retailers and, and find these elves. We gave away a thousand dollars. And we heard from many of those participating businesses um, that so many people came to the doors and said, I didn't even know you existed, um, you know, purchased something or came back again. So I think, you know, for us, that was really the goal is just to get people down here, uh, make sure they feel safe um, and get them shopping, get them dining, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a takeout order or whatever. So it was, it was very positive. Um, we were happy to be able to do that. And I, I think the businesses, you know, felt, felt the love from the community as well. Mm -hmm. I have a few minutes left. I wanted to talk to, uh, maybe Beth and Kat about networking. Beth, I know this is a big thing with you. You're sort of the networking goddess in the, the Valley. Uh, <laughs> the big thing, how important is networking for businesses? Maybe, and I know that uh, Kat, Pascal, you're involved with the Latinas Network, which I think is uh, Latina owned uh, small businesses. How important is that networking? Maybe especially for women owned businesses. How important is it to talk to each other and, and share information? It's extremely important. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's instrumental in, into uh, creating uh, maybe the desire, the want to keep pushing forward in, in businesses. Um, when you have somebody who's also maybe a mother or struggling through the same things, just being able to talk to somebody and be in the same network as that woman, it makes all the difference sometimes. Latinas Network now consists of over 100 professional Latinas. And so it goes anywhere from tellers to bankers, real retailers, and business owners. As a business owner myself, I find it easy to um, kind of help coach and, and share my experiences with others. Uh, but there are other women in the group that are ha being highlighted, like retailers in the area. Um, the real estate market is booming right now. And sometimes people don't know who to go to that they can trust or they're just Spanish speaking. Um, by highlighting these women, we're now bringing them to an, another level of of their business. Um, so networking is a, a big part of who I am as an individual, but it is something that I thoroughly enjoy um, just at a personal level too. And I know Beth is networking is a big thing with you. You, when you came on board, you seemed like you got more aggressive with the chamber as far as mixers and meetups and even online things for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and how, again, how important it is, is, is it with your members to kind of share information, maybe support each other, that type of thing. Absolutely. So, um, you know, a lot of it's what Kat said, just staying accountable and relevant. Um, I think it was, was so easy for some people just to crawl in a hole when COVID happened. And um, and they, especially if you're in a transactional based type of business, that's really bad to, you know, slow down in, in that way and not get back out there. So I think networking is so important just to remind people of who you are and what you do. Um, it's really more about, I think Kat and I both have a, you know, we get a lot more personal with our network so that we actually really do like who we're doing business with and trust them. And I've tried to bring that type of Bob to everything we're doing here at the chamber. We actually meet every Monday with a um, chamber check-in that started out with being COVID survival, you know, resources, where to find grants and money and um, how to adhere to the guidelines and all that. But now it's evolved into just traditional networking and it's just been really great now almost for a year to see that group 
you know, remain steady and I'm constantly getting, you know, this morning I got a phone call from someone new that joined us this week that said, who was this person and what was their number? And really that's what it's all about is, you know, just keeping business flowing and access mm -hmm. to support and resources. We only have about a minute left. I'm going to give Jamie the last word. Jamie, when this is all over, and I'm sure you guys can nod your heads, you expect <laughs> to see a lot of pent up demand. People that want to go to brew pubs and restaurants and shops and want to come downtown to museums, whatever. Do you just expect to see a pent up demand? We certainly hope so. Um, you know, we're uh, cautiously, optimistically planning for spring, summer, fall. Um, you know, just really hoping that it's, it's uh, safe, people feel comfortable, um, they'll come down enjoy themselves, have some fun again, shop local, um, whether it's downtown or anywhere else in the Valley, we of course support that, everybody needs it. Um, so yeah, we're, we're certainly hoping that obviously downtown is a, a huge uh, area for people to come enjoy events um, and everything. And it's been really sad to see so many of those have to be um, put on hold or canceled. We've had a number of those that obviously happened, um, but we're, we're very hopeful um, that we do see that huge uh, gathering happen again safely. Um, I know I'll be there. <laughs> I think, I, so, uh, I think I hear so the doorbell. There's business at the yeah. door there, Jamie. I uh, yes. want to thank Beth Bell, Jamie Clark, and Kat Pascal to come on today. We've been talking about small businesses. I'm Gene Morano. This is Business Matters. Until next time, take care. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.